So, hello. We have a little bit of time together, and I'm going to just set out some of the traditional understanding of the nature of the mind according to Tibetan Buddhism. This is a view which is rather different from uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition and also the modern scientific tradition. So, I think it would be undeniable to say that each of us present here has a mind. Having a mind gives us a sense that something is happening. Things seem to arise outside our mind and inside our mind. We look around the room, we see people, we think, they're not me. I live inside my own private skin bag. And looking out of my eyes, I see all these many different skin bags all around me. So we have a sense of being separate from other people. And with that, we have the irreducible complexity of trying to make sense of who other people are and how they are. For the self, the other is a problem. It's usually quite difficult to, work, to know what we ourselves think and feel, but to try to imagine what someone else thinks and feels, that's quite difficult. Therefore, it's much easier if we imagine that other people are very similar to us. That is to say, we simplify the world by inhabiting a, a series of assumptions about it. Assumptions make life quick and easy. They function as simplifications. But actually, life is quite complicated. When you look around the room, there's a lot, a lot of detail. This detail is immediately available to us when we receive it all at once. But if we try to describe everything that's here, if you were to try to make a, a written account of all that you could perceive, it would take thousands of pages. Because as soon as you start to describe what, how the room is, the room changes. People move about. Their posture and gesture changes. The expressions on their face change. This is not just a, a secondary order phenomena. But it's the, the truth or the actuality of how we present ourselves moment by moment. To be alive is to be interactive. And yet the concepts that we use to make sense of our world tend to move in a rather static direction. And we believe that our concepts indicate something meaningful. So we can say, I, James, I'm a man, and Kadri, who is translating, is a woman. But man and woman are rather empty signifiers. That is to say, they can only function because they are so minutely determined. There are many, many ways to be a woman, obviously, and many, many ways to be a man. And each woman is just herself. She's not some kind of numbered production from the woman factory. <laughs> And how she manifests is going to be influenced by all sorts of factors. Internal feelings, hormones, external if impacts like a boss at work, the season of the year, and so on. So we start to see that perhaps the main concepts that we use in describing our identity function because of their hospitality. The main conce concepts we use to determine our identity as a person so this is a room. The room will be used for many different functions. While we're in the room together, it looks like the room is like this. Some other event will occur, different people will arise, there'll be different seating arrangements. It will be the same room, but it will be as a phenomenal presence, it will be rather different. So in highlighting here the difference between the, com the concepts that we use to apprehend what is going on and the irreducible complexity of what is actually presenting itself. You can see that this concern also has an echo in European philosophy through the, the line of Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger and so on. What makes a difference from the point of view of Buddhism is that one can approach this... Uh, incongruity uh, between concept and actual manifestation, not just through concepts, but through meditation. If 
as you progress through school, you learn to think. And then you learn to think about thinking when you read a book and you have to give an account of it. And if you go to university, you learn to think about thinking about thinking about thinking. Mm -hmm. Because there's no end to concepts. Endless possibil possibilities of elaboration, of moving into further detail, unfolding contradictions, and so on. That is to say, we can develop the range of the contents of our experience. You can develop the kinds of concepts that you know through intellectual study. You can develop the kind of range of sensations and proprioception you encounter through engaging in yoga and dance. You can extend uh, the range of your uh, emotional responsivity through psychotherapy, through drama and so on. So this is fairly obvious. We're used to the notion of developing ourselves, having more of ourselves, unfolding more of our potential. And it's as if our, our self is a kind of dynamic totalization. We could, we could write an autobiography. We could uh, give an account of our lives. But would that be the same as our life? Life is perhaps in its lived moment, quite ungraspable. When you try to catch hold of life and describe it and depict it, it's like trying to catch a lizard. Because a lizard has the capacity to drop its tail off and run on to freedom. Life is always running away from our concepts. <laughs> so the question would be, can we come to live in the moment? A moment not achieved by interpretation or presented through comparing and contrasting with other accounts, but just to be open to the arising of the unified field of experience. So I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by this. So, when I uh, want to make sense of what's happening here in the room, I look for something to hold on to. So, our ordinary function of consciousness, operating through the five senses, providing information which our mental consciousness reflects on, is, uh, these are all shaping functions. We approach the world not as neutral observers, but with bias. We might not normally be aware of our bias, because we think, I'm just me. This is how I am. I see what I see, and good luck to you. Because if I was really to pay attention to how you seem to be seeing things, it would relativize my position. Instead of having the confidence that I can see things as they are, I might need to see that what I have access to is the view from here. The world I encounter is the world revealed to me through me. That the current patterning of the content of my experience, my feelings, sensations, memories, hopes and fears and so on, these act as a kind of veil or a refracting prism re highlighting certain features present in the environment and hiding others. So when people were meditating and becoming more aware of this, uh, realized there are two possible interpretations at this point. The first would be our rather familiar materialist view. The world is here. It's full of things. These things exist uh, in a way that allows us to describe them as nouns. So, for example, beside me there is a plant. The plant is here. And I can have my opinion about the plant. But my opinion is separate from the plant and arises after the fact of the independent, autonomous existence of the plant. And the world's full of things like plants. 
In fact, when I look around, you guys look pretty much like plants to me. You have particular shapes, and you seem to be you. And you were you before I met you. Okay, so that's one view. We're very familiar with that. The other view is more attentive to the actual nature of perception. So, if I look at you, do I have any access to the you for you? Perhaps only you can access you for you. Perhaps you're presenting a you for me. And then I, making use of the you for me, I then develop my own sense of who you are. The problem is I shorten the sentence. So now I think, oh, I know who you are. Really, the sentence is, I know who you are for me. Who you are for your mother or your lover or your children, I don't know. That is to say, each of us is a situationally, contextually manifesting potential. And none of us know what the next context is going to evoke from us. We don't know what sensations are going to arise in our body in the next five minutes. We don't know what thoughts are going to arise in our mind or what feelings. We live swimming in this flow of experience. And the, the experience, although it's immediate and reveals itself, somehow we can't quite get a handle on it, a hold on it, because the actuality of our life, moment by moment, is an arising and passing. This uh, self-narrative that I have is based on extraction of certain features which are then woven together into a reasonably coherent story. So it is as if I am knowable. And then I might assume that you also are somehow knowable. And when uh, extreme governments come into power, they want to know a lot about their citizens. So they have secret police and informers and dossiers. Because you can accumulate a lot of knowledge about someone, but we are alive. Being alive is not the same as having knowledge about yourself. That is to say, because we are interactive, because we come into being through interaction with others, the carapace, the shell that can form around us on the basis of our concepts is constantly being disrupted. Because we are interactive, we come into formation in a way that we cannot know before the interaction. So there is a, a difference and indeed a tension between ourselves as emergent phenomena and the stories of identity and predictability that we can weave. So the more we attend to the interplay of subject and object, we find something rather strange. Because I experience you as revealed to me through your movements and facial expression and so on. But I am also revealed to me because I don't know how I'm going to be. So, knowledge about me describes abstracted patterning. And uh, the nature of this abstraction is that uh, it relies on seeing ideas as uh, truth-telling phenomena. Yet, because of our interactive nature and the transience of thoughts, feelings, and sensations, the very ingredients to the seemingly stable narrative we develop are actually dissolving as they arise. But moment by moment, the ground on which we are basing these assumptions is dissolving. Because the things we say about ourselves, like we're tired, or hungry, or excited, or interested, are situational con con uh, descriptions, which only last a very short period of time. While they are valid, they seem to be a truth. 
when we are tired, we want people to respect that. Yet we are tired because we've maybe been doing a lot of things. Due to causes and conditions, I feel tired. The tiredness is generated by things which I might normally say are not me. And yet the effect being tired seems to be me. Just as I might say, I'm breathing. This looks like an amazing thing to be doing. But who's breathing? Mostly we're not very conscious in our breathing. Breathing is occurring, but I'm able to grab hold of this breathing and say, I'm doing it. I'm standing. Who's standing? Well, I'm standing due to the kindness of my knees, my feet, my muscles, my tendons, on the basis of the cooperation of many aspects of my embodied being, I come to a conclusion, I'm standing. So through this we can start to see the illusion of ego agency, that we find ourselves in becoming conscious in the process of life and interpret this in terms of our own starring role. I am living my life. I am an autonomous subject. <clears throat> no one's going to tell me what to do. But if you walk up the stairs, the stairs tell you what to do. Stair number one says lift your right foot. Stair number two <laughs> says lift your left foot. When you sit in a chair, how you sit depends on the height of the seat. That is to say, mainly we are reactive, responsive but we are intoxicated with the idea of mastery. I am in charge of myself. Now that the weather's getting colder, I have decided to change the clothes I wear. So this insertion of an inflated sense of self into our sense of, of how we develop in interaction is a, is a cause of great confusion. So we have a sense ordinarily of I have a mind, and in my mind there are thoughts, feelings, memories, and so on. And I have a mind, and I can do calculations and remember things with it. Well, so, say I start to think about um, what I did in the summer. Of course, many things happen in the summer, so just a few particular features rise in the mind. What is this mind that arises in? What is this uh, thing I call my mind that seems to be the receptacle within mm -hmm. which the memory occurs? We can have lots of ideas about this. Some people are convinced that the mind is in the brain. There's a lot of huge amount of money goes into research into the, the relation between uh, the, the kind of hard and soft aspects of, of a mental activity. <coughs> And you, this can give a lot of information about the mind. And so it's another method of producing concepts about concepts. But are we really just made out of concepts? Are we an idea? Something that can be apprehended in a, in a form-shaped image? When you walk in the park and you see some leaves gently swirling in the still air, is that a concept? Aesthetic sensibility, our capacity to offer reception, hospitality to what is emerging, uh, is perhaps beyond concept. The falling leaf is there and something is evoked in you, perhaps a kind of poignancy, some mood of autumn. So, the falling leaf and the mood that arises in you is a direct conversation, but one not particularly mediated through concepts. Aesthetics is very important for giving a sense of what Buddhists mean by awareness. In English, we can distinguish between consciousness and awareness. So, consciousness is the equivalent of what Tibetans call nampa shepa, which means uh, a shaping knowing, that there's a double move in which 
in the very process of knowing something, I'm shaping what I'm knowing. Now, because our knowing or our making sense of things tends to be de dependent on the information bank we've already built up, a lot of our perception is repetition compulsion. This is because we have a selective attention. Modern uh, consumerist capitalism is based on the possibility of commodification, turning things into a commodity, a thing which can have a market value and be traded. Well, this is the ongoing power of reification, of transforming anything uh, into uh, tr something tradable that can be compared and contrasted. So the aspect of our mental functioning that, that's able to perform that, we call consciousness. It's how I apprehend or take hold of the world. And when I'm in the park and the evening's drawing in, the light's very soft and the leaf falls, there's a mood. We can be aware of the emergence of the mood without quite knowing what it is and indeed without needing to quite know what it is. This is a particular quality of autumn, but also of twilight. In the twilight, we have this movement between the day and the night, between the clarity of the sunlight and the darkness of night, and it's a hazy transformative sphere. So as the light goes down, the tree looks different. So if you hold on to the concept, you say, ah, the tree is the same, it just looks different as the light gets fainter. This is, we say this because we don't believe our eyes. If you trusted your, sen your senses, this is a different tree. The world as revelation is always changing. Dynamic, interactive, ungraspable. But the world mediated through concepts becomes uh, knowable, predictable, and semi-reliable. So one of the functions, again, of meditation is to allow us to rest for a while in a state where our experience is less and less mediated through concepts. Why would we bother doing this? Because we might see that over-reliance on concepts is like a kind of opiate. It dulls our sensibilities because knowledge is now preceding experience. We know what's going to happen. So it starts to be just another day like the day before. And we find ourselves getting a bit sad, a bit depressed, a bit bored. Life's not very exciting. So we move between boredom and excitement. And in a consumerist economy, there are many, many products which can help us to mediate these two polarities. But if we thought, well, what might lie in the middle between excitement and boredom? Perhaps there's a possibility of a sustained availability in myself to receive the ever-changing richness of the unfolding world. This availability is the quality of awareness. Awareness is our lucidity and clarity which illuminates the emergent moment. Well, if we just relax in the out-breath, there's a bit more space in our uh, mental museum. We look around the room. What we see is shape and color. What does it mean? Nothing. It's just shape and color. But that's not enough, because I want to know what's happening. So I will have to tell myself a story about what is happening. The immediacy is here, just as if you walk along the beach, you look out, small waves are rippling and rippling and rippling. We don't need to count the waves. We don't need to do anything with the waves. But it helps if we can receive the waves to allow the waves to fill us. When we give ourselves to the waves, we are filled. 
when we think about the waves and remember what it was like at this time last year, it's a very different experience. Because now I am the shaper and the comparer for the ego sense of self. This is wonderful news. I have just secured myself some further employment. <laughs> Many jobs now are on this zero contract basis. <laughs> So no, our ego consciousness is very much like that. It has to keep proving its value moment by moment, which is why stories are so seductive for us. With modern electronic devices, you can be excited all day. <laughs> From the point of view of meditation, that excitement should actually be called distraction. What is here is always here. It is here. What is this? This is the field of my experience. When we finish and we go out of the room, we go into the corridor and maybe out into the cool evening air, we can imagine that we are individuals walking, or we can be aware of the body as it shows itself. You meet a friend and you greet them. Feels like me doing this. But if you relax the process of formulation, you find that you can be aware of greeting your friend. So, for example, I'm standing up because I like to see your faces. And most of you are sitting down. So you have the sensation of your body on the seat, on the back of the seat and where your buttocks are. And you can see what's in front of you. So body stuff, or body <laughs> vibration is arising. And what you see is also arising. The experience you have of your body and the experience you have of the room are both arising. If you relax, you can see that they arise simultaneously. There's no contradiction or conflict between feeling sensation inside your body and seeing the back of the room. It, rise, it rises all together. But we think, I'm in here, the room's out there. That's an interpretive thought. We know sometimes if we're dancing, the music just flows through us. And dancing moves from a conscious, intentional activity into something which is an uh, undivided flow between the sound of the music and the movement of your body. Moments like that are usually considered to be rather beautiful. By self-forgetfulness, we return to ourselves. We find ourselves dancing. We find ourselves on the beach just being washed by the waves. Perhaps you've had some experiences like that. Rather than thinking of these as rare or strange experiences, from the Buddhist point of view, these are identified as moments where the non-duality or non-differentiation of self and other becomes apparent. There's nothing wrong with concepts. They're useful for organizing and planning. But when they become the guarantors of meaning in our existence, many other planes of openness and receptivity become unavailable to us. So again, one of the functions of meditation is to allow us to become familiar with not reacting to arising thoughts. It may well be that many of the thoughts you have are just nonsense. Worries, anxieties, brooding over things from the past, regrets and so on. Even if you've decided not to think about that particular person or event, somehow when the thought arises you get meshed into it again. Well, you might think, well, they're my thoughts, why shouldn't I think them? But you're just the middleman. You didn't make the thought, they came in your mind. Now you've got to do something with it, like inheriting some ugly table from your dead aunt. <laughs> I don't really like it, but I, I better hang on to it because it was my aunt. The thoughts come in my head, it must be mine, I better do something with it. So in that sense, our mental functioning is a bit like a bicycle, where we have the two cogs joined by a chain. So we've got the wheel of what is arising in the moment, 
the wheel of our habitual orientation towards that kind of thought. And the chain is our involvement. What is that involvement? It may well be that in the course of your life you had some unhappy love story. Someone was once very special, and when you meet them a couple of years later, you wonder, what was that all about? <laughs> you are unavailable. You were once available. The availability is the being up for involvement. You want to see them. I need you. Then later, I don't need you. I don't want to see you again. This is fascinating. If only I'd known what you were like in the beginning. Unfortunately, you will never know what that person's like. Because all we ever get is the you for me. The person who you think is a total shit is still loved by their mother. <laughs> So, the power is not in the object. If it was in the object, the, the lovable person would always be lovable. We invest the other with a particular importance. And then we see the qualities as being inherent in the object. Years ago, when I was up in Newcastle, which is quite a strong area of Britain, and uh, I was sitting in a bar, and I saw a woman there wearing a T-shirt. And on the T-shirt it said, keep drinking till he's cute. Yeah. <laughs> the quality is not in the young gentleman in question. <laughs> but when we get a bit drunk, we can give ourselves to anything. So this is indicating involvement happens very easily to us. We are easily lost. And this is because if we sit within the domain of conscious ego, this ego has to make sense of whatever is going on. And that's a lot of work. So you start cutting corners and you assume. You don't see, you project. And because we are caught up in an intoxication with the stream of signifiers, we can't think our way out of it because thinking wraps us in the semiotic web, the interpretive web. So we just endlessly having thoughts about thoughts. I'm never going to do it again. We know this doesn't work, because we get lost. This is the quality of clarity of the ego. That is to say, not much clarity. But we also have awareness, which receives before it responds. Having received the broadest possible impression of the situation, there is an intrinsic clarity to that. Again, if you're on the beach, the wind is blowing, the seagulls are coming down, there's a slight uh, mist across the water, it's all there. You've, you've got everything. So this is a receptivity. Everything's been given to you, and you don't need to do anything to open yourself to it. And having received it, there's nothing to do with it. And yet, when we have an hour or two like that, somehow it's profoundly satisfying. We have a sense of peace. Now, we can't always uh, hope to find moments with a special aesthetic power to, to hold us open in that way. But we can hold the remembrance of them as a kind of encouragement to explore why, when so much comes without effort, why am I so busy making effort which upsets me? Perhaps more is available if I let go than if I grasp. So meditation, the whole series of ways of approaching the task of releasing and relaxing. Being busy constructing our world and maintaining it is a lot of effort. And no matter how hard we try, sorrow and difficulty comes into most people's lives. In the world today there are wars in many, many countries, many refugees from that. There's people whose countries have been trashed by hurricanes, flooding and so on. 
we live in a big world with big forces moving through it. And maybe when we put on the blinkers and we just try to keep our life on track, uh, maybe that's not the only approach or even the best approach. That when we are in touch with the spaciousness of our being and the richness of our potential, then these flowing together with the openness of the world allows many new possibilities. So the, the most important uh, direction of meditation <coughs> is deconstructive rather than constructive. It doesn't mean destroying, but by observing the impermanence of mental phenomena, just sitting quietly and seeing that thoughts indeed come and go, feelings come and go, sensations come and go, this transient nature of mental events <coughs> might really convince us that over-reliance on them it, as an attempt to secure a stable existence is foolish. So meditation would be the possibility that I could live with more space, more relaxation, and, of course, paradoxically, more connectivity. As we often think that our thoughts and feelings are themselves very connected. But perhaps they are connective through mediation. They bring their coloration, their bias, their influence. And perhaps we don't need that. Perhaps the world is meaningful in its beauty rather than in the stories we tell ourselves about it. If we do less, we can receive more. This doesn't mean that you have to renounce the world. I've had a very busy life working in a hospital, doing many different things. But what I have come to see very clearly is that most of life is quite simple. If I don't make it complicated. If I don't get in there turning things around and worrying about them and thinking they should be done differently. So you could say that meditation is a kind of canine training. So you could train the dog not to piss on every lamppost. And you can train yourself not to get so excited by everything that happens. We live in a time of hysteria. Many world leaders are extremely hysterical. They can't be calm. So even when things are peaceful, they have to stir it up. This is exactly the need to piss on the lamppost. Tweeting is a form of urination. <laughs> and this kind of incontinence of the mental bladder is uh, not a good sign. You can't uh, stop the pee coming out. The function of meditation is to have more space so that reactivity is allowed to dissolve gradually. And then there's less and less unnecessary arousal, which means there's more space to receive. And we find that the world's already full. It's rich. You can participate in. It's not all up to me. So this is the great deconstructive move of resigning your position as the boss of yourself. So rather than seeing myself as the master of my life, I find that I am a participant in life itself, which is always shared and co-emergent with others. This is a very, very short overview of how one might begin to start approaching the question of what is the mind. If you're interested, I'm going to be exploring a short uh, Tibetan text, which is from a very uh, clear tradition and shows in great detail the nature of non-duality. In, uh, in the Eastern traditions, non-duality is seen as the great medicine that heals the wound of the splitting of self and other. So, that's us coming to the end. It's been a pleasure to be here, share a little time with you. I hope you find some interest in what I said.